Hi, my name's Rachel, and today we have another Authors Behaving Badly. John Boyne wrote The Boy and the Star The Boy in the Striped Pajamas, and my brother's name is Jessica. Before I continue, I just want to say that anti-Semitism and transphobia are on the rise. The reason that this author is behaving badly is not just because of the books he wrote, it's because of the way he acted after these communities told him, hey, the way that you portrayed certain things is perpetuating stereotypes and misinformation. When told you're perpetuating harm, he refuses to listen, and that's a problem. While this may not seem as bad as what uh, Ye, the artist formerly, know, formerly known as Kanye West, is currently doing, what he's engaging in right now, or what J.K. Rowling is doing in the past several years, all forms of anti-Semitism and transphobia are harmful. It's a spectrum of harm. It needs to be called out. If you do any of these things in my comments, be it overt or covert anti-Semitism or transphobia, I will take care of it. I'm, I have a, I have a, can I open my monster with my weed pen? That's the question. I'm not gonna have y'all acting foolish in my comments. I won't allow it. I take enough shit from people acting foolish as it is. And I don't plan to allow that to bleed into transphobic and anti-Semitic territories. Uh, the answer is no. So if you do that, there will be consequences, be they reporting or just me telling you, hey, that's a problem. Here's why you can take that and go. <laughs> or you can get reported and muted. This is not a democracy. The comment section, uh, I am the king of it and I'm King Petty, so just a warning. Uh, this video is going to be pretty heavy. There's very uh, little chance that I could, I, 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 there's nothing for me to make jokes on here. But I promise that if you stay until the end, I will talk about something this author did that is unrelated to anti-Semitism or transphobia that we can all laugh at together. I, and I mean laugh at, for sure. And once again, asking Monster Energy to sponsor me. Thank you. Before I get into it, I have to say thank you for being a friend to my patron. First to those paying my therapy bills, you all. You old so-and-sos. Ella, Eric, Jill, Lex, Molly, SJ, and Zachary. Thank you all for being a friend. I super appreciate you. And to my potato starch Marxists, there are a bunch of you now. I'm so grateful. Thank you so much. Aiden, Allison, Brittany, Caitlin, Carlin, Celia, CJ, Chris, Corey, Diet Goth, Ebby, Elise, Aaron, Eden, Gloria, Gracie, Jillian, Jules, Kate, Katie O, Kylie, Laura, Marcella, Morgan, Nicole, Paige, Peggy, Reba, Sammy, Sarah, Shannon, and Sean. I got them all. Thank you so much. I appreciate y'all so, so much. Wait, where's my straw? Thank you so much for being a friend. Thank you for following my Patreon and supporting this channel. I'm so pleased that this is what I get to do for a job and help out my family. I am so happy to report that I personally paid off my son's huge dental bill myself, which is, uh, I'm not gonna cry. No, no, get it together. That's huge for me to be able to like, you know, pitch in and, and, and do something huge for my family is like, is a, is a huge thing. My kid has a, a really big dental bill coming up because our dental insurance is kind of garbage and uh, we have to pay the whole thing out of pocket. It is wildly expensive and I got to be the one to cover it. So I'm like really thankful that this has allowed me to do that. Thank you so much for your continued support and uh, anybody watching, thank you for being here. I appreciate y'all. Thank you all so much. And uh, if you want to join Patreon, the link is down below. You get early access and voting and stuff. Some behind the scenes content of uh, me raging about Empire of the Vampire, which God help me with that one. If you want to tip me, Kofi is the tip jar down below. And you can also, if you would like to commission me to read a particular book, either yours or someone else's, you can commission me down below at Kofi. Okay. okay, John Boyne is an Irish author who has written around 19 novels, some for young adults and some for adults, including his most popular book, which was a young adult novel called The Boy in the Striped, pa Boy in the Striped Pajamas. Why do I keep saying and? And it's about a friendship that comes about between a young boy who's a Jewish prisoner at Auschwitz and a uh, son of a Nazi commandant. Boyne himself is not Jewish. That needs to be stated first and foremost. Uh, published in 2006, it soar sold, sold, what? Sold more than 11 million copies. John Boyne himself is now a millionaire. It's been translated into 57 languages. It's a very popular book. A film version was made in 2008. A ballet was made in 2013, I believe, 2017. 
and an opera is coming out in 2023 called A Child in Striped Pajamas based on the book. Uh, by the way, reviews of the ballet are generally negative. The book itself has won a ton of awards like the Irish Book Award, uh, best like children's book of the year. Irish Book Awards won Radio Book of the Year, Calier Award for Best uh, International Novel of the Year for Spain, Orange Prize Readers Group Book of the Year, and Children's Books Ireland Book of the Year. And it was on the short list for a few others and the long list for a couple including the Carnegie Medal. According to research by the Center for Holocaust Education at University College of London, more than a third of teachers in England use The Boy in the Striped Pajamas, either the book or the film adaptation in lessons surrounding the Nazis genocide of the Jews and Sinti and Roma people. And some research conducted said that using this book elicits sympathy among readers but not for the actual victims of the Holocaust but also for the Nazis. The issue lies here. The issue that experts take with this book lies here. And to sum it up very quickly, I'll do a long version and a short version, is that the historical inaccuracies, like the ones found in The Boy in the Striped Pajamas, perpetuate dangerous ideas that there is a both sides way to view the Holocaust. There's not. Just like there was no both sides when Donald Trump said it, when people were being anti-Semitic here in the United States, there is no both sides to anti-Semitism. There's no both sides to the Holocaust, period. Jewish and Roma and Sinti people were murdered en masse. There is a victim, there is a perpetrator. Saying anything other than this is perpetuating misinformation that leads to anti-Semitism, period. That's the short version. The long version is this. Hannah Mae Randall, writing in a blog for the Holocaust Exhibition and Learning Center in the UK, said this about the book. Bruno is nine years old but doesn't seem to be aware of the war around him, who the Jews are, or even who Adolf Hitler is. Bruno is the son of the Nazi commandant. As a young German boy and the son of a senior SS officer, Bruno would have been, by law, a member of the Hitler Youth. He would have attended a German school where students regularly swore oaths to Hitler and where anti-Semitic propaganda infiltrated every part of the curriculum. Children were taught that the war was something to be proud of as it meant that Germany would become a great power once more. Bruno's characterization perpetuates the belief that most German civilians were ignorant of what was happening around them. In fact, the general public in Germany and in occupied Europe were well aware that Jewish people were being persecuted, forced to emigrate, and eventually deported. There were also many who knew that Jewish people were being killed. Many Germans profited from the Holocaust as Jewish properties and belongings were Aryanized, which meant they were taken from their Jewish owners and given instead to ethnic Germans. A minority of German civilians resisted na Nazi ideology. Nazi authorities stamped out resistance to this regime quickly and brutally. As an audience, we learn a lot about Bruno, so he becomes a real-life boy in our imaginations. However, Schmuel is only ever depicted as a one-dimensional victim. Schmuel has no personality or individuality, so the audience doesn't build an emotional connection with him. This means it is harder for the reader to empathize with Schmuel and his situation. Schmuel's characterization portrays Jewish victims as passive and unresisting. However, Jewish resistance did exist both in and outside the concentration and death camps. At Auschwitz-Birkenau, a group of Sonderkommando Jewish prisoners forced to do the terrible work of hurting people into the gas chambers, then removing the dead bodies, successfully managed to blow up one of the crematoria and kill a number of guards. It is important that people understand that Jewish people did not go to their deaths without trying to save themselves. Schmuel's story is also historically inaccurate. For readers of the book, it is clear that, that the camp is probably the Auschwitz concentration camp complex, as Bruno calls it, out with. If a young boy like Schmuel had entered Auschwitz-Birkenau, then it is very likely that he ha would have been sent straight to the gas chambers on arrival, just like the majority of children who arrived there, as the Nazis didn't consider them useful as forced labor. A small number of children were chosen for medical experimentation, but these children were kept away from the main camp. Even if Schmuel had been selected for forced labor, he would not have had the opportunity to spend most of his days sitting on the outskirts of the camp. Because the focus of the story remains on Bruno's family, the book does not engage with the main tragedy of the Holocaust, that none of the people in the gas chamber should have been there. Due to the way in which Schmuel's character is portrayed 
portrayed in the novel, his character doesn't engage the reader's sympathy in the way that Bruno does. Schmiel represents the one and a half million children murdered by the Nazi regime in Auschwitz-Birkenau, in the death camps of occupied Europe and in the killing fields where millions of civilians were shot into mass graves, yet the reader's sympathy is directed towards a Nazi concentration camp commandant and his family. Some of the book's historical inaccuracies and stereotypical portrayals of major characters help to perpetuate dangerous myths about the Holocaust. These are but some of the issues, the historical inaccuracies, the attempts to show both sides ends up humanizing Bruno more than Schmuel, the actual Holocaust victim. And in teaching Holocaust history to children, who this book is aimed at, it's important that we don't further engage in further dehumanization of Jewish folks when doing that is exactly how these atrocities were committed against them in the first place and how people justify their anti-Semitism today. Unfortunately, John Boyne has rejected and continues to reject uh, up as far up as 2022 uh, these, cri these critiques. This link to Hannah Randall's uh, explanation of the inaccuracies in the book and why that's harmful had actually been given to John by the Auschwitz-Birkenau Holocaust Memorial Museum, who said that John Boyne's novel, The Boy in the Striped Pajamas, quote, should be avoided by anyone who studies or teaches the history of the Holocaust. This was after the author criticized, John Boyne felt that he had the right to criticize, the uptick of recent novels set in the concentration camps, like the trend of naming a book the blank of Auschwitz, the tattooist of Auschwitz, the librarian of Auschwitz. Boyne had said, I can't help but feel that by constantly using the same three words and then inserting a noun, publishers and writers are effectively building a genre that sells well, when in reality the subject matter and their title should be treated with a little more thought and consideration. John, come on, man. And the research center at Auschwitz-Birkenau said, we understand those concerns and we already address inaccuracies in some books published, like they at, you know, it, ad nauseum had gone on and on and explained the issues of the tattooist of, Au the tattooist of Auschwitz. They, say it, they said that it contained numerous errors and information inconsistent with facts, exaggerations, but they said the boy in the striped pajamas, same issue, and here's a link explaining, and they linked to Hannah Randall's uh, post that I read from, and instead of saying, oh, you know what, you're right, <laughs> uh, I am just like all these people I just criticized, John Boyne decided to say, while I absolutely respect your right to recommend some books and discourage the reading of others, it's worth pointing out that the opening paragraph of a, the attached article contains three factual inaccuracies and only 57 words, which is why I didn't write on. And then said he thought he treated the subject matter with great care in my novel, although readers are of course feel free to feel differently. It's not just readers feel differently, it's that Jewish folks are telling you, you wrote in inaccuracies into your book that perpetuate dangerous misinformation that leads to anti-semitism. Why would you minimize that? When faced with opposition about this, rightly so, uh, he doubled down and said all I said was that the Auschwitz Museum was linking to an article, not an article that they had published or written, that addressed supposed inaccuracies in my novel, which of course was a work of fiction, and therefore by nature cannot contain inaccuracies, only anachronisms, and I don't think there are any of those in there. John, what are you doing? Uh, his stance has not changed. In 2020, he said of the Holocaust Museum's tweets in an interview, it did upset me. I've spent more than 14 years going into schools across the world and helping to educate young people about the Holocaust. That is wildly inappropriate. That is not your place. I've probably devoted more of my time to this than any other living novelist and have always ensured that kids realize my book is a novel, not a work of nonfiction, and directed those who are interested to the books they should read next. So while I, of course, have nothing but respect for the Auschwitz Memorial, I was feeling, I was left feeling that those 14 years of sincere, honest work had been entirely in vain, and yes, that hurt. Yes, your work was in vain. Your, your work was a waste of time, because in the end, you misportrayed the Holocaust and inspired empathy for a Nazi commandant's son more so than the actual Jewish victim in your story. That's a problem. A dick. And then in 2022, he is still talking about this and actually published a sequel called All the Broken Places, which came out September 15, 2022. And in this year, his his stance has not changed whatsoever. He said, people on the internet claim that the book is factually inaccurate, but fiction cannot be factually inaccurate. It's not people on the 
internet, you are leaving out that the Jewish community, including historians and people who work to preserve the truth of the Holocaust, have told you that your work is incorrect and perpetuates dangerous inaccuracies and myths and stereotypes about Jewish folks that have a tangible effect in the real world. Mari from My Name is Marinez often talks about media literacy. I'll link to her channel down below. And something that she really stresses is that it's never just a book. Media does not exist in a vacuum. Again, I'll link her channel down below. She's brilliant. Go watch her. Media does not exist in a vacuum, John. Your, your your book, you're right, has had an effect on the world and Jewish folks who are affected by it are telling you that that effect is not good and that's the group of people you need to be listening to. The fact that you so vigorously avoid saying that those are the people saying, hey, your work is harmful and just chalk it up to, ah, it's just worthless noise on the internet is so shitty, like so unfathomably and just like there is no depth there's, there's no end to the depth of how shitty that is. Like, it's it's bottomless. He also says, it's still selling and still being talked about 16 years later. I have been studying the Holocaust since I was 15. There are rumors online that I did no research, but I have been researching this for years. Why does your research even fucking matter, John? If you don't value his, like, accuracy, if, if it's just fiction to you, then what, which is it? Do, do you value it being historically accurate because you did all this research? Or is it a work of fiction so it doesn't have to be accurate because you think that it exists in a vacuum and, it, and it, it can't possibly like harm anybody even though Jewish folks are telling you that it does. Which is it? What value does your research that you've been allegedly doing since you were 15, which I, I call BS honestly, what value does that have if you think anachronisms can't be harmful despite Jewish reviewers explaining it to you repeatedly? What value? And also what value do your little tweets about, oh I think it's really shitty that publishers and authors are writing books called The Tattooish of Auschwitz. Why should I listen to one single fucking thing you say. Unfortunately, this is a trend for John, where he thinks that other people's experiences are open for him to write about, get wrong, do harm, and then shrug when called out over it. Uh, in April 2019, John Boyne wrote a book called My Brother's Name is Jessica, another YA novel, a story about a transgender girl, but written from the perspective of her confused younger brother. Now, John is a gay man, okay? That is true. It is, that is true. He is a gay man. He's part of the LGBT community. How, however, I am also part of the LGBT community. I am pansexual, bisexual, under that umbrella. And I would never think to write a book about a trans experience in the way that John did and then not take any, like that's not my story to write. I would never. So like why he thinks that that's appropriate just because because he, like, just because you're part of the LGBT community does not mean that you get to write each other's experiences. Every single person's experience is so widely different. We cannot speak on behalf of each other. And if we do, then we... Uh we, we risk really fucking it up like John did. Trans poet and speaker Jay Hyun spoke publicly about the book on Twitter saying, it's bad. It hits so many stereotypes we fought against for years. And the trans character saves the day at the end by turning up at home dressed as a boy with stubble, etc. Reading much of it made me uncomfortable. The most dangerous part is, though some of the problematic parts of the book can and will be picked up on by almost anyone, much of the issues lies in the overarching themes, inaccuracies, and stereotypes, which will then be perpetuated by the readers. Just like Jewish readers were concerned about with the boy in the striped pajamas doing the same thing, John. Jay says, there's a focus on trans people's bodies, particularly Jessica's hair. There's also a focus on genital genitals and Jessica's, quote, willy, which I can kind of see a younger brother focusing on. And he is the narrator, but also he is fully 13 years old. The parents in the book are bad parent stereotypes with no time for their children and yet do a 180 in the last few pages to become caring and supportive. It creates a space for transphobic parents to argue that they're not transphobic because they aren't as bad as those parents. There's a quote, secret cross-dressing scene, a focus on clothing, and multiple instances where it's stated that the trans character wanted dolls as a child, all upholding regressive ideas of gender stereotypes and expression that trans people have been fighting against for years. The supportive aunt is some kind of eccentric hippie who is vegetarian, rides a horse because cars are bad for the environment, and has multicolored hair, etc. There are so many TRA, which stands for a Trans Rights Act, 
activists, stereotypes that are being ticked that it makes me wonder who the author has been talking to. There's so many other small things, so many problems, I don't have time to list them all here, but in truth, the problems with this book aren't surface issues or misunderstanding. There's a deep transphobic rot at the heart of my brother's name is Jessica. It's incurable. Everyone is asking about the ending. Jessica's mom wants to be prime minister. She's on the brink of getting the job when her rival leaks the fact that her son thinks he's a girl to the press. Cue transphobic headlines. It's made very clear that this has ruined her career. Then Jessica turns up just as the mom has gone outside to announce to the press she's giving up. Jessica is in a football shirt, has cut off her hair, hasn't shaved and says, I've gone back to who I used to be. It's what you wanted, isn't it? It'll help you get the job. Then the mom does get the job. And also in the epilogue, the younger brother's homophobic bully turns out to be gay and is his best friend now. And the brother visits Jessica at uni for like three paragraphs and she's trans again. Maybe the author thinks that makes up for it. It's also worth stating that the title itself misgenders Jessica. Then in a further tweet, Jay says, I held this back because I didn't want to speak for inclusive minds, but I couldn't stay quiet so here's some more info about this book for you. I need to speak about this quote from John. I work with Inclusive Minds, the group he claimed in this article, to have consulted for his transphobic book. By the way, Inclusive Minds is a collective for people who are passionate about like diversity in children's books, diversity, inclusion, equality, and accessibility in children's lit. Having read this, I immediately demanded from Inclusive Minds to know what was going on. They didn't know what I was talking about. And it's a quote from John speaking about the book saying, while writing the book, I spoke to several trans people as well as an inclusion ambassador at Inclusive Minds, an organization dedicated to promoting diversity and equ equality in children's literature. So Jay is seeing that it seems that John lied about working with Inclusive Minds on the book, which begs the question, did he actually speak to a single trans person about the book either? Or was that a lie too? Before it was even published, he said he was apprehensive about how the book will be received by the trans community, but that he hoped people would see that he treated the subject with care. John, which is it? <laughs> What the fuck? Did you have trans readers look at it? Did you work with them? Did you work with inclusive minds or not? Why would you be worried about how the trans community would receive your book if you already worked with a bunch of people by your own words beforehand? It gets more uncomfy though because he said in an article in the Irish Times entitled, why I support trans rights but reject the word cis, as in cisgender. Boyne wrote, it will probably make some unhappy to know that I reject the word cis, the term given by transgender people to their non transgender brethren. I don't consider myself a cis man. I consider myself a man. It's it's channeling. It's it's reminiscent of of, of something. What am I thinking of? Hmm. Sounding a little bit like the only race is the human race to me. He doesn't explain why he doesn't want to be called cis. He just says he doesn't want to label a scribe to him that he didn't like take on himself. But cis is not a bad word. So it leaves most of us like scratching our heads, um, wondering what the fuck his problem is with. <laughs> Effie Martin, a trans woman and the director of Transgender Equality Network of Ireland, says that she thought Boyne's unwillingness uh, to use the term was him ignoring his cis privilege, which I agree with her. She wrote in the Irish Times saying, the only time I refer to people as being cis is when discussing trans issues. This is to distinguish them from transgender and non-binary people. In the same way, if I were involved in a discussion about, say, Black Lives Matter, I would point out that I am a white person speaking from a position of privilege. Boyne, whether he likes it or not, is a cis man speaking from a position of cis privilege. Because the default in society is seen as cis. Trans people are a minority and people who are trans face discrimination in ways that people who are cis like myself simply don't face. And as you may have predicted, when faced with this backlash for the poor trans rep, he doubled down. He had a lot of people angry with him on Twitter and he ended up deleting his account over this. The hashtag John Boyne is transphobic was trending. People were calling for a boy boycott of the book, My Brother's Name is Jessica. Of this, he later said, do I believe trans women are women? Yes, I do. Simple answer to a simple question. Yes, I do. I support trans women's rights or trans people's rights 100%. Great but you should still listen to them when they say, hey, John, you got our rep wrong. I mean, like, you want to get credit for doing the bare minimum, you won't find it from me. But then he continued saying, do I believe that women have the right to at least hold a conversation about de defending their own spaces? Yes, I do. So he's talking about the trans women in bathrooms thing. 
So he just, uh, he just stepped right into the transphobia. But really, do I think as a man that I have any right to have any involvement in the subject at all? No, I don't, to be honest. It's not for me to define what a woman is. It's not for me to tell women online what a woman is. I have so many, I have so many questions. So now you value the opinions of women online all of a sudden, first of all. Second of all, so you do think that cis women should have a right to at least hold a conversation about depending their own spaces, which is going to leave out trans women who are already in danger. There's no evidence to suggest that trans women will assault cis women what are you doing John? What are we doing here? But then you say, do I as a man have any right to be involved in the subject at all? Then why did you say the first part, John? It's not for me to define what a woman is. It, mm -hmm. You know who it is for? Women including trans women. So I... <sighs> What are you doing? What what are you doing? There's an awful lot of people online who just scream at women and when they are issuing their death threats and rape threats, we are supposed to think that these people are decent because they put their pronouns in their Twitter bios. Ah, it's talking about trans right acti trans right activists. Yeah, okay. When you try to destroy people's lives, their livelihoods, their reputations, that does not make you a good person. And when you lie about people as I've been lied about, I will always defend myself. I would advise everybody else to defend themselves too. I I actually can't stand this guy. Like I actually I actually wish that all of his food forever would be um too spicy and that he has perpetual diarrhea. That's what I wish. He was asked, "Do you want to elaborate about the whole I don't want to be called cis thing?" He said the stupidest shit I've ever heard. We are being told consistently by everybody that we are allowed to self-identify, right? No matter who you are. Why is that any different for me than everybody else? I do not see myself as a subset of men. I don't call myself a gay man. I don't call myself a white man. If I was to call myself a cis man, I am defining myself in opposition to transgender people. I think the word is quite transphobic. You, a cis person, think that being called cis is transphobic. What? If you tell me what you want me to call you, I will call you that. But by the same token, I expect to be called what I want to be called. You are white though, John. <laughs> Like you don't, you don't get to decide whether or not you're white or cis. Like that's, you, you are what you are. Trans people were always trans and uh, you clearly are a cis man because you said you call yourself a man. You were assigned male at birth. So therefore your gender matches your sex. So you're a cis man. You're also a white man. Like these are not labels that are being ascribed to you. They are simply what you are and they come with privilege that you don't want because you want to be able to speak on issues that are not yours to speak about. That's the whole thing. He further says that the backlash against him only exists online and therefore insinuates that it has no merit, saying, I have never had one single person come up to me at an event on the street, at, in a bar or at a festival to say anything critical about that book. I've only had people come up to me, including members of the trans community, many of whom hosted events for me when I was doing the books or in England telling me how appreciative they were of it. Why would a trans person who disagrees with you come to you in public and say I didn't like your book? Why would they put themselves in danger like that? Why would a Jewish person do that, John? What the fuck are you asking for? You're asking for people to show up in person to tell you they don't like your book because it has inaccurate representation? The fucking Holocaust Museum told you it's not it's not right and 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 you're like eh, only exists online don't care what's wrong with you people accuse me of writing an act of violence it's a novel for christ's sake something has to happen in it for the story to develop you're so disingenuous and disgusting like you you could have written something else you're you're speaking as if it was the only thing that could happen for the story to develop it could have only gone one way bullshit and i'm not going around cutting off people's ponytails that's what happens to Jessica in the book. To me, it just shows a basic un lack of understanding of what a book is. John, gross. <sighs> he goes on to say, I'm not a provocateur. In 20 years of career, I've never been. I don't seek to hurt people, but I still come back to the fact that I do have the right to defend my work. And just because somebody is a part of a minority, that does not give them the right to defame somebody or to be nasty about them or to be cruel. He then brought up fucking JK Rowling, and that's when I knew this man has deluded himself beyond hope. Like there is no reaching him, honest to God. JK Rowling is a supporter of trans rights and she's also a supporter of women's rights and she should be heard. Everybody should be heard without immediate vilification. We just need people to be more respectful of each other and certainly to educate each other more. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go on a little tirade right now. I fucking hate the word respect. 
I fucking hate it because people use it wrong and the way they use it is like quite insidious. So for instance, I've talked about a little bit my mother-in-law on here. She's always demanding respect, right? When you look up the word respect, respect means admiration. Why should I admire you, John? We need people to be more, if we switch the term, we need people to be more admiring of each other and certainly to educate each other more. Why should I admire you when actual Jewish folks and trans folks said, hey, this is harmful and here's what you did wrong and here's how you could have gotten it right. You, you don't show, the word that you are actually wanting to use is either um, obedience or consideration. So pick one. Do you want people to obey you and listen to what you have to say even when what you're saying is harmful? Or do you want consideration? Because you were considered. But also these are not your stories to write. So you don't need respect. What you want is silence so that you can continue doing what you want to do. What you don't want is to consider the groups of people that you're writing about that you're not a part of, but think you have a right to write their stories and then lie and pretend that you got help with these stories and did enough education on these stories. I'm just tired. He then gives a pathetic uh, non-admission saying, it's perfectly possible I should have educated myself more before writing that book. Okay. I'm begging John to never have kids. That's all I'm gonna say. That's all I'm gonna say about that. Please don't ever have kids because he's channeling mom who does not know how to apologize when she's pointed out how you abused your kids. That's what it's channeling right now. He says, I may not always get it right. No one does, but I'd rather give it my best shot every time than be someone who gets their kicks by tearing strangers down through phone and thumb and then walking away with a smug smile thinking I told him the new dictators try to define discourse, control literature, and instigate online attacks. Perhaps they feel voiceless but screaming like jackals rather than talking like humans isn't helpful. After 20 years of publishing novels, I know that real writers write from the gut regardless of the abuse that comes their way. I don't have any more words. I do actually. The problem, John, is that you are yet another cis author who is writing a trans story, getting it wrong, perpetuating harmful stereotypes and myths, and hindering progress rather than advancing it. And then when set, when ex, when it's explained to you how you did this, you cry as if you are owed something by readers. Anyway, he's a dumbass. I promised something funny. So here it is. In his other book, which is a historical fiction set in the real world, uh, who cares what the title is, it's set in the 5th century, okay? And he has a character talking about how she makes red dye for clothing. Unfortunately, it would seem that John <laughs> um, did as poor of research for this fucking book as he did for all the other fucking things he writes. But at least no one got hurt over this one. Um, the current top search for ingredients red dye clothes links to a guide from Polygon on how to dye clothes in the video game Zelda Breath of the Wild, Breath of the Wild which if you don't know is my motherfucking shit. I fucking love Breath of the Wild. New one's coming out next year. I'm just gonna be doing vlogs because I'm so excited. The amount of audiobooks I'll be consuming, wild. So it seems that all John did was type ingredients red dye clothing and hit the top link. That's it. That's as far as research goes because he quite clearly used Polygon's uh, article on how to dye cloth clothing in Breath of the Wild because he used items from Breath of the Wild in his book. And before you say, oh, maybe he did it on purpose, he did it. He's just fucking stupid. <laughs> Let me read it to you. He says, the dyes that I used in my dressmaking were composed from various ingredients depending on the color required, but almost all required. Nightshade, sapphire, okay, those are things found in the real world, right? Until, Kisi Wing, the leaves of the silent princess plant, <laughs> octorock eyeball, swift violet, thistle, and hightail lizard. Ah! <laughs> my six-year-old knows what those are. In addition, for the red I had used for Abrilla's dress, I employed spicy pepper, the tail of the red Lizalfos, and four Hylian shrooms. <laughs> You're so stupid. You just showed that you don't know how to research jack shit. You just go to Google and type how to do, and, and then you just, you just click, and then you just put it in and 
what are you doing? I mean, like, if you, like me, are a fucking nerd, you know that all those ingredients are found in Zelda. John, who doesn't know shit about shit, did not know that. This was not an Easter egg. He did not do this on purpose. And when he was alerted to this um, information, he didn't reflect on his incredibly obvious trend of poor research skills. He said, someone remind me to add Zelda to the acknowledgments page when the paperback of this book is published. Oh lord. And just like all of his other mistakes that stem from his lack of research, he says he plans to leave it as is. Who could have guessed? Not me. Anyway, that's the story of John Boyne and why he is a badly behaving author. Uh, if you have uh, read The Boy in the Striped Pajamas, let me know. That's not a book that I was given. It came out in uh, 2006, which was right when I entered high school. Um, and I didn't go to a high school that <laughs> read a lot of books, to be honest. So it doesn't surprise me that it was not part of my curriculum. But let me know if it was part of your curriculum or what you all read instead. All right, I guess that's it. Leave your comments and questions down below. Thanks so much for watching. Patreon and Ko-fi tip jar slash commissions are down below. That's it. Okay, thanks for watching. Happy Halloween. See you next time. Bye. Oh, did you see my Halloween nails? Spooky. Nice. Okay, Alexa, say bye. Goodbye. By the way, you have a new notification. Quiet. Quiet.